Tonight we're especially pleased. This is such a exciting program. I, um, I get the Workman catalog every year and always love to look through their catalog of cookbooks. They have great cookbooks. And um, I saw this one and I thought, wow, this is really going to be um, something that I would like. And I think a lot of people will like this book. And so I contacted Michael Rockliffe, who's kind of a friend there at Workman, and said, is there any possibility that this author will come? And he said, well, she's on the West Coast. I don't know, but let me see. <laughs> And I wondered how that happened. So, uh, <laughs> so I am just so excited because she's Aww. been in Boston and New York, and she's stopping here. And I also hear this is the first library she's done. Yes. So please um, give her a real <laughs> library welcome. Claudia Thank Lucero. you. And it's actually been my favorite stop so far, so I'm really glad you made that happen. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, my name is Claudia Lucero. I wrote this book, One Hour Cheese. I taught myself how to make cheese. Um, and, you know, started in 2007, 2008. I looked up recipes online and found books at the library from the 70s and 80s. But a lot of them were targeted towards farms and people who wanted to make cheese professionally. So the recipes called for five gallons, 25 gallons of milk. And I thought, oh boy, I definitely can't do that in my apartment kitchen. So what am I going to do? And so I just started experimenting, willing to fail, and and Surprisingly, most of the time it didn't fail. Most of the time the cheese was edible. So I just thought, why is it this easy and we don't do it more often? And so I kept um, at it. One of the first cheeses I made was a paneer, which if you're not familiar with it, it goes in Indian food, kind of like tofu, but it soaks up the you know, delicious curries and stews and broths that you put it in and it doesn't melt. So I really enjoyed that cheese. And then I moved on to ricotta and kind of developed a mozzarella. Uh, and on and on, and so I decided to start a little business to, sell, to pay off my student loans. I thought, you know, if I could put these in a little box, put everything that everyone needs, save them the trouble that I had to go through to cut down the recipes and find the right supplies, the right thermometer, the right cheesecloth, etc., maybe somebody would be interested. And so um, I, I don't know if you're all familiar with Etsy. It's an online handmade marketplace. It was kind of getting started at the time, and I was dying to put something on there. So I decided to put these little boxes with all the supplies in there and made do-it-yourself cheese kits. And they kind of took off. Whole Foods Market found me. You know, fast forward a couple years later, William Sonoma, the kind of big, fancy kitchen place, found me. And I created kits just for them and, and their customers. And so uh, soon after that, Workman came my way and said, you know, you keep coming up in the cheese making world. Would you be interested in writing a book? I knew exactly the book that I would write because I'd been teaching classes. And I knew what was difficult for me when I just started. So I wanted a lot of photos, so step-by-step -step photos, so it's almost like a class. I wanted all of the cheeses to be made in under an hour because I knew those were my popular classes. People liked coming to the class, seeing me start with milk, see the curds and whey separate, make cheese, and actually get to taste it before they got to leave. Uh, it makes it, I think, really accessible for you watching to think that you can really go home and make this yourself tonight. So I hope you enjoy it. Today we're going to be making um, what I call uh, French kisses, so it's a goat cheese, and I call it French because we use sort of the summer um, herbs. Uh, whatever you happen to have in your garden or even dry herbs would work, but we're going to use rosemary and sage today. We also have um, uh, tarragon and chives here. Also thyme and basil are really nice, so whatever you enjoy. And the neat thing is that we're going to infuse the goat's milk, which is what I have here, a half gallon of goat's milk. We're going to infuse the milk with the herbs as it heats, almost like making a tea, an infusion. So the neat thing about that is you can fish the, the herbs out, and the milk is going to have all that flavor without seeing the herbs. And, and, you know, I mean, on the one hand, there's the fiber of the herb, and so that's one thing. But the other is the surprise of having a cheese, and you think it's going to be mild and not really have another flavor. But then tasting kind of that herbal explosion from the infusion is pretty fun. So I'm going to turn my heat here to medium. We're going to go to a pretty high temperature, 185. So I like to keep the temperature pretty high. So I'm going to put 
just one sprig of the rosemary because that tends to be pretty strong, uh, and a couple of the sage. And I think since tarragon is pretty similar to basil, I think I'm just going to put a little sprig of that too. There's no mirror, but it looks really neat. <laughs> uh, floating, you know, herbs and this really nice white goat's milk. So one thing I want to tell you about goat's milk um, is if you can find it, just lightly pasteurize or raw is best when making cheese, especially goat's milk. If it's ultra pasteurized, you'll have a difficult time creating curds and whey, and that's what you need in order to make cheese. Um, I forgot for a second, we're also adding for extra creaminess a cup of cream, so heavy cream, also not ultra pasteurized, so just pasteurized or raw. And it says really clearly on the package and you can read it and find it there. So all of that will heat up to 185. And I'm, as we chat, I'm just gonna keep stirring the bottom to make sure that the sugars, the lactose in the milk, aren't getting sticky and burning at the bottom. So that's one of the things you have to watch for when you are heating something to a high temperature like 185. So we'll just keep going as I stir. We talked about milk a little bit. Now let's talk about the other ingredients since we do have some time here. We're at about 115, so we got a ways to go. Okay, so we talked about the milk, goat's milk, not ultra pasteurized, same with the cream, that's cows. You can use uh, cow's milk if you'd like. Um, the rennet is not going to be used in this cheese. Rennet usually I'll use in cheeses that require that will result in some stretch, so like a mozzarella, a string cheese, that kind of thing. Um, and there are about seven out of sixteen um, recipes in the book that require rennet, and I like to use vegetarian rennet. One because it lasts really long in the freezer, so the animal rennet is pretty perishable. So if you're not a real, real frequent cheese maker, if you're kind of just doing it as a special thing now and then, it's nice to have the stuff that doesn't go bad in six months. So um, I recommend those, and I tell you in the book the sources and everything and how to get them. Um, salt. What's that? I freeze my vegetarian rennet tablets. Yeah, tablets. They're well, and even those are nice to put in the freezer and in the um, refrigerator. But if you use the junket tablets, they're much weaker than this vegetarian rennet stuff, and so you might use even four times as much as the, the vegetarian. Um, and just to say a little bit about rennet, if some of you don't know, traditionally it's the stomach lining of an an, a ruminant animal. So the enzymes in that stomach break down the milk for the, for the, the um, animals to digest their mom's milk. And so we discovered that those same enzymes will create curds and whey and create cheese. And so that's, that's how we ended up with that. But vegetarian rennet can be made out of many things, usually the fungus family. Um, but, you know, today we're going to be using um, vinegar. And you can always use lemon juice. Yeah, lemon juice, lime juice. Uh, and all different types of vinegar work. Today we're just going to use a white, regular wine vinegar. Um, and you can use apple cider, that's one of my favorites to use because each acid is going to give the cheese, the final cheese, a flavor. And so you might find your favorite. You might find that you really love making or coagulating with lemon juice because it gives the cheese a nice flavor. And like I really enjoy apple cider vinegar because it gives it a little bit more of a, a depth, I think, that's more closer to an aged cheese, even though it's not aged. Just kind of that fermented flavor. Uh, but you can use them pretty interchangeably. They're just going to give you that different flavor, as I said. But as far as the quantity, they're the same. So let's take the temp. Salt. Um, if you are not aging cheese and you're not adding the milk or the, the let me back up, that's confusing. Um, let's say you might see me refer in the book and other um, cheese making resources to something called cheese salt. So the reason we use kind of that code word is because there are certain things that are assumed when you say cheese salt, and that's that the cheese doesn't include iodine in it or um, anti-caking chemicals and agents. And so that's because those would inhibit the enzymatic activity of rennet and cultures and mess up coagulation when you make more complex cheeses. Uh, what you just have to remember for this is that the easiest thing is to get a pure salt. So if you turn around a container of salt that you buy at the store, it will say salt only, which is what we want, or it will say 
ore and sodium or calcium. I forget what the things are called that separate salt and make it so it doesn't get clumpy. Couple different, two or three ingredients that they'll put in there. So you don't want that and you don't want iodine. You just want pure salt. And so here we have one from Penzi Spices that was provided, thank you. Only $1.39 for all this, kosher style flake salt. Says right there, does not contain iodine and when you turn it around the back it says salt. And that's all you want. Uh, and so there's also sea salt, which is great, um, or pickling salt. So the only thing really other than the purity that you're looking for is it should be really fine or really flaky so that it dissolves very easily, quickly and evenly in the curds. So that if you do make a nice wheel, like that nice golden wheel that you see up at the top there, the smoky cheater, you won't cut into the wheel and some of it will be really salty and some of it will be really bland. You want it to quickly dissolve and, and um, flavor the entire wheel of cheese. So that's it about salt. The equipment, really, really basic. Stainless steel pot. I, I like to use stainless steel everything as much as I can because you know when you're cleaning it that like wood or like um, plastic uh, with the cups and utensils and things like that, you're not going to get those little scratches that can harbor bacteria and kind of, you know, end up dirty with your cheese. So uh, if you use a glass pot, an enamel lined cast iron, that all works really well. Stainless steel, what you don't want in your pot is aluminum or um, cast iron that doesn't have the coating. Because you use so much acid in cheese making that you're going to corrode your pot and as you're corroding that metallic flavor is going into your cheese. So you don't want any of that. Um, let's check the temperature because it's getting a little foamy but not too steamy. But all this time, those herbs are infusing the milk, and we're going to get a taste of that toward then. This is actually a really great time to pass out a sample that we've pre-made for you. The sample is of a cheese that I call first timer's cheese. So that's a cheese that probably most of you can go home and make tonight with whatever you have at home already. It just uses um, any old milk that you might have, cow's milk, um, low fat, full fat, uh, any of it would work tiny bit of it, I think it's like a two cup batch, I can't remember, really, really low, just because it's whatever you might have. Um, so let's see, 178 about, so we're close. Um, and then any old acid that you have. So if you have the white wine vinegar, the apple cider, lemon juice, you can use any of that as well. And then all we do is, um, you don't even need a thermometer, you just heat the the, the milk up to almost boiling. Even if you see one bubble where it boils, just turn off the heat right then so you know you don't need a thermometer. You just kind of look for those signs where the milk is really, really hot. That's when you put in your acid and you're going to get to see that in just a minute here. And when you put in that acid, it's going to quickly separate into curds and whey. And you're going to drain those curds, salt them. You can put pepper in, you can put dry herbs, chili flakes, whatever you enjoy. You can even do honey, uh, jam, and just make your own uh, little custom cheese. And I call it first timer's cheese because it's pretty fail proof. It's for, it is. First four pages you're going to find that cheese because I want to prove it to everybody that you really can make cheese right now with normal supplies that you have in your kitchen. Uh, and then from there you'll gain confidence and you'll say, well what about mozzarella? What about uh, paneer and ricotta. So let's see where we are here. We're close. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to turn it off right there. Well, let's make sure that a couple different spots in the pot do measure that. It's not as big a deal when it's an induction thing, but if you have electric or if you have gas, you know, some parts of the pot might be hotter than others. So we'll turn it off at 185. So here I have my quarter cup of the white wine vinegar pre-measured. Oh, first we gotta take those herbs out. So here they are. Our cooked rosemary and sage now. little guy there. Okay. And so foamy. I don't know if you can really see any of that, but you know, foamy like this, like a latte kind of thing. Nice hot milk. I don't know if this thing remains hot. 
I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay, so then you pour it in and you mix it in gently. Mix the rest. This is already pre-measured to a quarter cup and the rest. You just want to be gentle because as your curds are forming, you don't want to break them back up into liquid. And then almost instantaneously you get curds and whey. So let's see if I can show you how much more lumpy it is than before. And then the, the stuff that's um, loose there is the whey. You have white curds, the solids, with that kind of yellowish liquid, the whey. And that's perfect. That's exactly what you're looking for. So not so appetizing right now, right? But <laughs> we're going to swap now this way. And actually, this recipe asks that we let the curds and whey sit for a few minutes. And we're going to do that. This is great coagulation, so I think that's some really great um, cream and, and goat's milk. Normally, it may take a few more minutes of letting it sit there. And what happens is the, the curds, the solids, are getting cooked by the hot whey. And what happens when you cook them is they release a little bit more whey. So uh, the longer you leave them, the drier they get. So it's kind of a tricky thing. You don't want to leave them so much that your cheese will be gritty and dry. Uh, but you also don't want a really loose, soupy ricotta type of thing. Uh, and it's a little ricotta like when it's warm. When you put it in the fridge, it gets a little bit more solid. And this recipe, I call it kisses because what I did in the end, you know how you see goat cheese in logs or in little wheels? Well, I took them instead and made little balls and kind of puckered them like that so it's like a big Hershey kiss and it's a, um, a little kind of individual portion appetizer uh, with the goat cheese. And so the longer you leave it, kind of the, long, you know, the tougher the curd gets, and that's a good thing. That's what you want. So for those of you who do go on to try some of the recipes, um, this is a lot of what you'll see. And so for something like paneer, ricotta, um, this one, another one that I call toast cheese in the book, this is what, where you will stop. And that's how easy the, the cheeses are. And then you know, there'll be different flavorings, different shapes, different milks. And so that's what will make the difference between the cheeses. Um, sometimes you press them, like in the case of paneer. But in the case of mozzarella or string cheese, halloumi, some of the others that use rennet, you're going to be doing something in addition to this here. So you would scoop these out, drain them, and heat them again to make squeaky curds, to make that smoky cheater, the mozzarella, like I said. So uh, this is about half the time of those others, but they're still all done in under an hour. We're draining right now so that all the whey goes down into a bowl. You can certainly just do it into the sink, but I like to keep the whey and do a lot of useful things with it. So some of the easy stuff, because if you think about it, whey protein powder is just dehydrated whey. So they put that in smoothies, right, for a protein shake. So you can put it in a blender with fruit and bananas and you know peanut butter, whatever you like, uh, and make a smoothie. So that's, that's a really easy one. So you see how clear the liquid is? Um, yeah, and the way and the curds are all here. So you keep it in the fridge one or two days if you're going to use it right away, and then you can put it in the freezer after that. So you always have it because some other handy uses are creamy soups, so like a butternut squash soup, mushroom soup, cooking beans, chili, curries, really anything where a more nutritious liquid could be useful instead of water because there's still whey protein, calcium, other minerals in there. And it has the benefit of that milky flavor because it still tastes like milk. It's interesting um, and, and you know, kind of sweet. So if you think of those characteristics, that's what it would be good in. Cooking rice with it. Um, you can use it instead of water or buttermilk in pizza dough or biscuits, you know, any kind of bread making type of thing. So um, you can just leave it like this and drain it in your colander and it would be just fine. It might take a little bit longer than if you hang it. So sometimes I like to do that. Tie this into a knot, put a little bit of cotton twine, and just hang it off of a, a kitchen cupboard or something. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, faucet in the sink too. I always end up needing the sink if I do that. So, <laughs> of course, also the cupboard. I'm thinking, oh, that's the cupboard. So I'm swinging bags of curd all the time. Uh, but it kind of drains so quickly that you can just kind of hang out and hurry it along. Um, and so that's about the, the batch size for that half gallon in a cup uh, that we made. I'm going to pour some of this. No, I'm going to switch it this way. Just because what's happening now, there's so much whey that I see it peeking through the top of the colander. And when I put this down, I don't want the curds sitting in the whey. We do want to drain them. So, All right, the next step, and let me show you both. First, the pretty one, the curds. Now, let's do the walkabout with the whey. So this is actually ready as is. You could already make a cheesecake with it, fill some pasta shells, some roasted uh, peppers, or put it on bread with tomatoes, simple and done. But, you know, if you want to make it complicated and fancy, you can do all kinds of things. And so if you skip the salt, then that's when you could go um, sweet with it, right? So if I'd skip the salt, you could mix um, honey right into it, and then you would be done. And like I said, you can use it as a spread, just like this. Done. You know, just put it into your little container, keep it in your fridge, take it out for breakfast, um, or you can shape it. So I'm going to try to cool it. Typically for shaping, you have to put it in the refrigerator a little bit, but I'm going to try to cool it enough so that uh, we can shape it a little bit at least. And, and the way I'm going to do it instead of the kisses, because uh, it's pretty hot to knead it and touch it, is I'm going to put it in one of these little molds. And so this is actually a French cheese making mold. This is what they make some of the French cheeses in. And you know those little boxes I told you that I make? Uh, so in there I include everything for that particular cheese. So in the goat cheese kit you get two of these little guys. Um, so I'll show you. But you wouldn't need this. If you have a cupcake tin and you drain enough of the whey, because that's what the holes are for, uh, then you can just spoon the pretty much dry curd into there. <clears throat> Flatten it out so that you don't have air bubbles. And it's very soft because it's so hot right now. And so then you would need to put this in the freezer five minutes or uh, even at room temperature for, you know, 20 minutes or so. It will cool just like all cheeses when they cool, they kind of um, solidify and keep that shape and then you'll pop it out. So um, I'll leave it there to cool a little bit while we continue working on this one. This is the point then when you would add the fresh cracked pepper, um, the dry herbs. This is, you know, I could mince a bunch of this stuff and put it in here. Uh, but since you remember we infuse the milk with the herbs, uh, it's already flavored in there. But, you know, it didn't, it didn't change much from when I passed it around. It just sort of got a little more fluffy. Salt, when you put it in, releases a little bit more of the moisture. So it did lose a little bit more of the whey, but not much. So let's see. I'll show you. So yeah, it's pretty dry now. I can hand that off to you. It's very cute. Um, and then I'll pour this here so that you see how much the salt release. And since we put it there, it's not very much, but it does make a difference. So that's it. Um, so now let's see if this is cool enough to pop it out. It might just pop out into a little bit of a loose wheel, but you'll get the idea. So, you know, this is just a small portion of that. I think we could probably make about four or five of these. So the neat thing is you can flavor them all differently. So if you didn't put the herbs in the, in the um, milk, it would be very kind of a, a blank canvas, right, for you to do anything you wanted with. So the first one could have red chili flakes, the next one the honey cover the other one in all black pepper. One neat thing I like to do is spoon in half of the curds, then sprinkle something in there so it makes a line, and then cover it up with uh, curds again. And then when you pop it out, it's kind of really fancy looking. <laughs> it's like parfait, yeah. All right, so you just pop it out. <laughs> and you have a little wheel, yeah. And like I said, cupcake tins, measuring cups, any kind of bowl, you can make it a big wheel by doing it just like a little soup bowl kind of thing. So other than the rennet, the book also asks you to get really fine mesh cheesecloth. So the stuff at the grocery store with the really big holes, 
a cheese like this or a ricotta has a small curd because we're after a creamy cheese, those curds would go right through the big holes. So either you do like six layers of that stuff or you find some that is the fine mesh. It's called butter muslin. I also tell you where to get it in the in the book and because I made these kits I sell all this stuff and uh, my my business's name is Urban Cheese Craft and so uh, you can get everything there but you can also go to a, a fabric store and if they have just a, a kind of thin cloth that you think liquid would go through um, that would work for you. That cloth is very reusable that's the nice thing about it being tightly meshed is it doesn't fall apart you know with one or two uses I rinse it with cold water immediately so that the curds don't dry into the cloth and then ma basically make it disposable. You rinse it with cold and then I hang it in my kitchen. Next time I do my kitchen towels, I just put it in the wash, goes through the dryer and everything. It might come out kind of bunched up, but then all you have to do is wet it and it'll spread again right over your cheesecloth. So really, really nice and reusable. So I give all kinds of neat tips in the book. Um, there's a page right before every recipe that gives you sort of the, the helpful tidbits. It's in this little wooden um, cheese, what do you call those, cutting board type things, you know, cheese board. Um, and so it'll say the, the level of how easy it is. And I rated them easy, easier, and easiest. <laughs> so you know that they're all easy. They're all for beginners. But if you really are afraid, you know, start with the easiest. <laughs> and the easiest would be that first timer's cheese that I told you about. Page four. Uh, how, you know, ready to eat in 20 minutes, ready to eat in 45. What kind of milk um, do you need? Uh, what uses it has? So the fact that you can use it for lasagna, use it for a cheesecake, um, et cetera, if it's like, you know, particularly just for melting, that kind of thing. So I tell you all of that there at the beginning because I always, in a cookbook, I kind of want to know what, if I have everything right away, if how long it's going to take, do I need to put something in the fridge overnight? And so I came up with the biggest pain. So it tells you this is going to be the part of the recipe that's not the most fun, you know. And it'll be something like straining lemon juice of the seeds, not a big deal. Thank you all very much. Thank you.